All right, good morning, everybody. I hope you're ready for this weekend message. Uh, I'm ready. I hope you're ready. You're not ready. (laughs) Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 through 21, just three simple verses. Genesis 50, verses 19 through 21. For those who first time, we're in a series called The Story, and we're going through the major narratives of the New Testament and the Old Testament to show us how the Bible is so connected and correlated together to give us the same message. Now, I want to start like this. Um, have you ever said something like, you know, if I were God, I'd be doing a better job with the planet? <laughs> Here's the problem with that. Uh, there are many things you see that happen in the world that you say, I just can't see a good reason for that. The problem is, just because you can't see a good reason for that doesn't mean no good reason exists. The reason you can't see it is because you're not God. And God is omniscient. He knows all things, but you don't. And the sooner that you recognize that, the better off you're going to be. There's an old story that's told, and every year I go to Africa, I tell the same story. And they laugh every time. And I think it's because they like the simplistic humor. And it's the guy who's seated under an acorn tree. And he says, God, I think your sense of proportion is all out of whack. Because they've got this big tree and little bitty acorns. I look out, and there's little plants and big, big watermelons. God, your sense of proportion is out of whack. And about that time, an acorn drops from the tree and hits him in the head. And what does he say? Thank God that wasn't a watermelon. Just because you can't see what's happening doesn't mean there is no good reason. You're not God. You're not omniscient. You're not all-knowing. We are not all-knowing. Now, when we come to the story of Joseph, there's something powerful that happens in this narrative. And what happens is we're reminded that God uh, is able to do something that is beyond our understanding. Uh, Not only one thing, many things. But one of those things is it's amazing that he allows every single one of you in this room to live a life of freedom, to make the decisions you want to make, to do what you want to do, to choose to do good, to choose to do bad, choose to do greatness, righteousness, unright, whatever. He allows you to choose, and he not only allows you and this generation, but every generation that's ever lived, God allows all of us to do what we're going to do, to decide what we're going to decide, to live the way we want to live, and ultimately he takes all those decisions and still brings it to his plan, what he wanted to accomplish all along. That's powerful. So, you know, that to me is a greater miracle than God just predetermining everything that ever happened, making us all like robots. That, I mean, that'd be the easy part if you're God. The harder part would be, I'm going to let all of you have your freedom, but I'm going to take all your decisions collectively, and I'm still going to bring my plan to fruition. That is a great miracle. You don't see that anywhere more than you see it in the life of Joseph. Now, in Joseph's story, there's an upper story and a lower story. Now, you know the upper story, right? If you've read in the story, or if you haven't, let me help you. The reason God chooses Joseph now is because a famine is going to come up on the land. And it has the potential of destroying the people of Israel. So God's got to intervene. He's got to do something because he made a promise to Abraham. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And through your people is going to come one that will bless the world. Well, if all the Israelites die, that ends that plan. God, having foreknowledge, knows that a famine is coming. And he chooses Joseph. He's going to use one man, Joseph to save an entire nation. But Joseph doesn't know that. So he's going to live this entire life, and it's going to be a lot later in his life when he knows all of a sudden, hey, now I, now I know what God was doing. But he lives his life where you and I live in the lower story. He doesn't, he's not privy to the information in the higher story. He doesn't know what God is doing. He only knows what he's doing. Now you think about Joseph's life quickly. Uh, let's schematize it. Just, Joseph's life, this kid cannot catch a break. He's 17 years old when this starts, and his brothers don't like him. They want to kill him. Now, part of it's Joseph's fault. He's an arrogant punk. He is. His father gives him a coat of many colors. What does he do? He wears it every day. Hey, guys, look at this. You know, it's like his father, your father giving you brand new Nike shoes and everybody else uh, Chuck Taylors or something. But he gets this beautiful coat of many colors, and he flashes it around. And he has some dreams. He has these dreams where the wheat bow down to him and the stars and sun and the moon, they bow. And he says, it doesn't, you know, the implication is all my brothers are going to bow down to me. Look, there are some dreams you have. Keep them to yourself, man. (laughs) Uh, You might have gotten them from God, but that's okay. But that's between you and him. You don't have to tell everybody. And so Joseph kind of wears the coat, tells everybody his dreams. So finally the brothers have had enough. He goes out to Dothan, which is a secluded area. And his brothers say, we've got to kill this guy. And so they throw him into a pit, a cistern. They're going to they're kill him that way. One of the brothers says, nah, you know, this is kind of a bit cruel. Let's not do this. And another brother says, man, if we're going to do away with him, let's at least make some cash. Let's sell him. So they sold him to the passing Ishmaelites in a caravan who are going to take him to Egypt and sell him as a slave. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, of course, the boys have got to explain to Father Jacob what happened to Joseph. Now, here's what's interesting. 
Jacob makes the same mistake with his son that Jacob's father Isaac made. Isaac favored one son over the other. Isaac favored Esau over Jacob. And Jacob became miserable. Now Jacob's doing the same thing with his 12 sons. He favors Joseph. And anytime you do that in the family, you bring heartache and strife and struggle and pain and suffering. It's just the way that it is. And so Jacob does the same thing with Joseph. Now remember, Jacob's going to have a name change. He did into Israel, and these are going to be the 12 tribes of Israel. So God is going to save them through the work of Joseph. But Joseph's life is very interesting because the brothers come back to Jacob. And remember, any time a Hebrew narrative includes detail, it's not just for fun. Hebrew narratives are very specific, or they're very general. When they're very general, you don't need to know any more information than you receive. When they're very specific, there's always a point. They take Joseph's coat, and they dip it in goat blood. And they take the coat back to Jacob, Joseph's father, and they say, a ferocious animal has devoured your son. And the Bible tells us that Jacob weeps and turns his face away and tears his clothes in sackcloth and ashes, a way of mourning in the Old Testament. He can't bear the thought of losing his son. Now, Joseph, in the meantime, is sold in Egypt to Potiphar, who is an official representing Pharaoh. Joseph, now here's where it starts, somewhere along this line, this starts at 17 and ends when Joseph is 30, so he's very young. Somewhere along the line, God starts to work on Joseph, and Joseph starts to realize, I've been arrogant, you know, I, I need to be changed, I need to have a heart transformation, and God changes his heart because he starts to do the right no matter what it costs him, and it does cost him. That's important for you to remember. Joseph does what is right, and it seems like every time he does what is right, he pays for it. For instance, he goes to Pharaoh's house, Potiphar's house rather, and Potiphar notices his wisdom and administrative capability, and he puts him in charge of the entire household, his servants, his vineyards, his travel schedule, whatever, and everything's going well until Mrs. Potiphar checks Joseph out, and the Bible says that Mrs. Potiphar noticed he, had, he was well-built and handsome, and she well, forced herself on Joseph. And Joseph said, no, I, I cannot do this. Now, he doesn't say, I can't do this because it would be a sin against Potiphar or a sin against you, Mrs. Potiphar. He says, I can't do this because it'd be a sin against God. God said, don't do this. Don't do this. And I can't do it. Well, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. That's not in the Bible, but it's still no less true. <laughs> And she was furious, man. So what does she do? She forces herself on him again, and she grabs his cloak as he tries to run away. So he's running through the palace streaking like a Ray Stevens song, you know, and he's just trying to escape. And then what happens? He does the right thing now. He's been honest. He's shown great integrity. He's, he denied himself something, I'm sure, that would have been a temptation for any man. And yet what happens? She goes to Mr. Potiphar, and she says, Joseph, approach me. He ends up in the dungeon in prison for two years. Now, folks, this is not just a prison like today where you have television and a workout gym and a library. Back in these days in the ancient civilization, there was death and disease and contamination in the food. I mean, you didn't survive very long. There was no light because everything was down in the dungeon. Prisons were down into the ground cold and dark. What does Joseph do? Well, he still follows God even in the dungeon. The warden is so impressed by his administrative skills and his care and concern for the other prisoners that he puts him in charge of the whole prison. He says, dude, why should I work? You can do all this on your own. I'm going to put you in charge of the entire prison. Where does that get him? Well, it gets him. The other prisoners trust him. And so two of them have a dream, a baker and a butler who used to work for the Pharaoh. And Joseph interprets the dreams. Now, this is quite humorous because the butler says, here's my dream. And Joseph says, oh, I know what that means. In three days, you're going to be restored to the Pharaoh and be given your rightful place in the kingdom. And he goes, yay. And then the baker comes and says, wow, that was a great interpretation. Me next, me next, me next. And he tells him his dream. And Joseph said, oh, yeah, I know your dream, Mr. Baker. In three days, the king's going to remove your head and the birds there are going to feast on your flesh. <laughs> Not so good. He said to the butler, because both those dreams became a reality, and he said to the butler, butler, when you get out there to the Pharaoh, would you remember me? Because I've been placed in here, and I don't deserve this. Would you just put in a good word for me? The butler does not. He forgets. Now, isn't it interesting? God could have reminded the butler, hey. Yeah, God could have said, hey, butler. <laughs> you know, Joseph. <laughs> no. He, he, so what does Joseph do for doing the right thing? Two more years in the dungeon. Four years now we're up to, in the dungeon. All through that, you're going to see that happen. Then, look, look, let me schematize his life for you. He does the right thing. He shows honesty and integrity. He follows God no matter how hard it is, and his life keeps going this way. 
And then, about the time he's 30 years old, now it's been 13 years, it's a long time, Pharaoh has a dream. He has this dream about seven fat cows and seven thin cows and uh, ears of corn, plenty and wanting. And all of a sudden, the butler says, wait a minute, Pharaoh, there is somebody that can help you because he helped me when I was in prison. Well, thanks for nothing. And it's amazing, God did probably put that into the mind of the butler, because a lot of time had passed. Joseph comes out, and he says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, I know the the interpretation of this dream. Egypt is going to suffer seven years. Seven years, they're going to have plenty, and then seven years of famine. And if you will administrate and manage the goods and the productivity during the years of plenty, you will save the entire land of Egypt. Pharaoh, so impressed with Joseph... The Bible says on page 33 of the story, or in Genesis 41, 42, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger, representing power, and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of linen, representing the wealthy, and put a gold chain around his neck. And if you know the rest of the story, through one man, through one man, and a lot of pain and suffering, God saved the entire nation of Israel Because Joseph was in charge of Egypt, and because he was in charge of Egypt, he could also feed the Israelites, and he did, and he saved the nation from extinction, and God kept his promise to Abraham, for they would flourish, and they would continue to grow from that point. Now, isn't this interesting? Then we come to this definitive part of the narrative, Now I want you to stay with me here, because Joseph's brothers even after they had sold him into slavery and all this had happened, they come now to Egypt to try to find food. They're starving. Joseph's going to feed them. Joseph plays a little game because they don't recognize Joseph. And then Joseph at one point reveals himself to them and now they know this is our brother that we thought we sold into slavery. We thought would be dead by now. They go back to their father, Jacob. Somewhere along the line, Jacob dies. He'll never get to see Joseph. The brothers come back, and it's, it's quite humorous. They say, uh, Dad sent us. He's not living anymore, but he wanted us to read his will to you. And his will says, be nice to your brothers. <laughs> and when Joseph hears that, the Bible says he wept. And then here's the definitive line. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Now, listen. And if you, if this is the time to write stuff down, if you're somebody that writes stuff down. What you see in Joseph's life, we know the upper story, but Joseph is a narrative written so that we would know how we have to live in the lower story while God's doing the upper story. And you find three things evident in Joseph's life that I think you find in any heart that's been transformed by the power of the gospel. Any heart that's been transformed by God, you find three things. Here's the first one. Joseph is able to love his brothers, forgive his brothers, and to continue to do the good even when his life continues to go south because, one, he stays off God's throne. The first thing he says in response to his brother, am I in the place of God? This is the theme throughout the Bible. Most of your problems, most of our problems come when we start sitting on God's throne. Think about it just for a second. You go back, the the shortest Bible ever must have been in the garden in Genesis. Three pages to it. Number one, God loves you. Number two, don't eat from that tree. Number three, the serpent says, oh, when you eat of that tree, you'll become like God. Now, what does that mean? I mean, has it got God juice in the tree? You kind of eat the tree, God juice. Now I'm all powerful and I'm omniscient and I'm everywhere. You know, what does that mean? No, it's, it's not that mystical. It's far more simplistic. It simply means, you know God said don't do this. When you rationalize and you tell yourself that you can, at that point, you take the chair of God. I want you to hear me on this. I'm going to try to build this thought. Stay with me. Ravi Zacharias tells the story about Ham Pham who was a translator for the American preachers during Vietnam. After the war was over, all the American preachers left. He was left behind. The Viet Cong arrested him and put him in a war camp. Horrific situation. I mean, they tortured him. They forced him to read Engels and Marx and tried to brainwash him out of his faith in God, into atheism. And they would torture him, and they told him, we're going to torture you until you renounce your faith. 
And he was a young boy at this time, young man translator. They would even bring him plates of food after he was hungry, and it would be human excrement. They would continually torture and punish, and every day force him to read Marx and Engels and anything that was anti-God. One day, he was so depressed, and he writes this in his book, this is how we know. He says, you know what? They successfully have brainwashed me. I'm thinking, I'm in this hellhole. I mean, if God is real, why am I still here? Why would he not take me out of this prison? And he said, you know what? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and do something I've never done since I became a Christ follower. I'm going to wake up tomorrow, and I'm not going to start my day with prayer. I'm not going to pray at all. And he woke up the next day, and he did not pray. And that same day, the commander of the war camp put him in charge of cleaning the latrines. As he's cleaning the latrine, he looks over in a waste paper basket, and he sees wadded up piece of paper with human excrement on it, but it's written in English, and he had longed to read English again. It had been a long time. So he took that piece of paper and cleaned off the human excrement, put it in his pocket. Later on that night, a flashlight that he had found, he was able to read. It was Romans chapter 8. The commander of the war camp had been using the Bible for toilet paper. And he says in his book, the first word he read, if God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He will work all things together for his good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. He says in his book, he dropped to his knees and began to weep. And he said to God, God, you wouldn't even let me go for 24 hours. In one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption, there's a line that says, get busy dying or get busy living. He decides to get busy living. He's going to try to escape with 50 others. They start building a boat. The Viet Cong come to him and say, hey, we hear you're trying to build a boat. Are you trying to escape? And he says, no. Then he gets back to the bears and says, here I go again, God, trying to run my own life when you've shown me that you're in charge the whole time. If they come again and ask me if I'm building a boat, I'm going to tell the truth. I am not going to bear false witness. They come one hour before they're ready to take off. And they say, we hear you're trying to build a boat. Are you trying to build a boat and escape? And he says, yes, I am. <laughs> what are you going to do? You going to put me back in prison? They said, no, we want to come with you. <laughs> and the two Viet Cong. He writes in his book, if it wouldn't have been for these two men who came with them, who were experienced sailors, when they hit a ferocious storm, the boat would have capsized and all would have been lost. But because they navigated the seas, they were all saved in the end. Now here's my point, because I'm thinking, what's your point? You are not smart enough to determine right and wrong. Now I want to say something to this generation between the ages of 19 and 30. I love you, first of all. I do, I do. And, I, I, and I've got great confidence in you because you love social justice, and I'm all about that. I love you. Every generation makes a mistake. Here's yours. We can talk about mine sometime. I'm 50, but let's talk about yours. You think you're smart enough to determine what is right and what is wrong, and you're not. Stay with me. What do you mean by that? You don't think right and wrong are absolute categories. You think you get to determine what is right in any given situation because you've been taught that. But that makes life unlivable. For Joseph, think about what he could have done. Well, I am in charge of Potiphar's house. I mean, after all, I am the slave. So if Mrs. Potiphar wants me, who am I to deny her? We are, after all, two consenting adults. And we're not really hurting anybody. Yes, you are. You're hurting God because God said, don't do that. These are stolen waters. This is a married woman. She does not belong to you. And Joseph says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Not sin against Mrs. Potiphar or Mr. but sin against God. Joseph never put himself on the throne. He stayed off God's throne. Let me, let, me help you, let me help you get very simplistic with this so we make sure we're on the same page and I'll move on. You go to Denny's. Okay, there's your first moral violation right there. <laughs> but you go to Denny's, and there's a sign on the door that says, kids under 14 eat for free. You got two kids. They're over 14, but they look under 14. The waitress asks you, are your kids under 14? You say, yes. You go in, you get two free meals. And I see you later, and you tell me the story, and I say, you did wrong, you lied. And your response is this, yeah, but Denny's doesn't need my money. First of all, you don't know that. You're not omniscient. What if there's a manager working at Denny's who's, if he doesn't match his quota, he's going to be fired, and then he loses his job, and he can't, fight, he can't feed his family? What about that? What if everybody did what you did that came to Denny's? You're not smart enough. You're not omniscient. You can't know what all possibly is happening all around you in every situation. That's why God says, here's the rule. Follow it. Obey me, even if it costs you. I know what I'm doing, and I know every side road and side issue that you don't. That's exactly the way Joseph lives his life. And the serpent still whispers into everybody's ear, 
when it comes to stealing, killing, coveting, whatever, did God really say that? Is that what he really meant? The other way that you get on God's throne that Joseph never did is if you take your inordinate worry. Jesus clearly said on the Sermon on the Mount, why do you worry about your food, your clothes, your health? He says, only our Father in heaven knows what you need and has the power to give it to you. Let me tell you why we sit around worrying. Let me, let me tell you why you're a chronic worrier. Excessive worry comes when you think you're absolutely certain what has to happen and you're afraid that God will not get it right. You, you, you're here and you want to get there, but you think you only know one way to get there, one path to get there, and if you get off that path at all, you think God's not doing his job, so you've got to take back the reins. You're not God. Joseph kept doing the right thing even though his life kept taking unfortunate turns. He was willing to do what God asked him to do, even if it led him into the dungeon for four years, even if the path included being falsely accused, even if his own brothers abandoned him. He gave up God's chair. He never took his seat in God's chair and realized that only God knows what happens to happen today, what has to happen tomorrow, and in the future for my life to turn out the way it ought to turn out. He let God be God, and by doing that, no worry, no stress, just peace and confidence. Let me, let me ask you one more question. Why are you a chronic worrier? How about this? Why are you a chronic complainer? Because it's Mother's Day, I will refrain from mother-in-law jokes, but <laughs> enough said. Why are you, why are you, you know why we're chronic complainers? Because you think you're omniscient. You think you know how your life should be going better than God does. And so you just complain because it's not working out exactly the way you think it should. You're getting in God's chair. Stay off God's throne. Joseph did that. And because he did that, he did what was right. No matter what happened, he kept trusting God. He knew at the right time and the right place, God would lift him up. Most of us live lives of chronic frustration because we won't let go of the reins. And every time something happens in your life, you think God's abandoned you when in reality... He knows exactly what he's doing. Not only that, stay with me now. Joseph takes God's view. He not only stays out of God's chair, he takes God's view. In verse 20 now, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now stay with me. Shorter sermon today. Uh, <laughs> Philip Yancey's one of my favorite authors. Okay? Brilliant mind. He loves to climb mountains, lives in Colorado, and he says this in his book, Rumors from Another World, I believe that's the title. He says, climbing mountains presents a constantly shifting point of view. Climbing mountains presents a constantly shifting point of view. I go out behind my house and I face a wall of granite thousands of feet high, he says, daunting and overwhelming. But as I got closer to the wall of granite, I see a thin path that goes around the mountain and the seams. And what I previously thought was insurmountable, now I can see that I can actually climb by zigging and zagging. And every time I zig and zag and go around the mountain as I make my way to the summit, the view totally changes. First I see aspen trees, and they're marking my journey each step of the way. But then I get to the other side of the granite rock and I see that the aspen trees actually circle an alpine lake. So my view is even wider. And I climb higher and I realize that as I see a lake and a forest, they're nestled in a, a valley below that is dotted with lakes and meadows and groves of trees. More beautiful still. But then I go higher, even higher, and I see that the entire valley is cut into the side of the mountain and that streams of water are spilling into its lakes, tumbling several thousand feet to feed a river that runs through a canyon that's just 20 miles from my home. And then he finishes by saying, only when I reach the summit does the entire landscape fit together. Until then, any conclusions I might draw would prove mistaken. You hear what he's saying about your life? He's saying, you have no idea the twists and turns of your life. You have no idea if they're appropriate or not appropriate until you get to the summit and you look back and you say, oh, now I know why I had to come that way because that is the way that leads me here. That's what Joseph did so well. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm not smart enough to know what God is doing in my life all the time. Think about it. Most people live 
with these two options. They pit the valley and the mountain against themselves. In their mind, here's their theology. My life is good, therefore God is good. My life is bad, therefore God is bad, or he's abandoned me. That's how most of us live. My life is good, therefore God is good. My life is bad, therefore God is bad, or he's abandoned me. Joseph doesn't take that view at all. To him, there's another view. And that view is this, that life is bad. And sometimes people will betray you. Sometimes you'll be sold out by people that you're close to. Sometimes your life will go south rather than north. Sometimes things will not work out the way you hoped they would. And sometimes this world will make a couple of attempts to kill you. But God is still good. And he's good because he will take all of that winding road and get you to the place that he wants you, that you want to be. But you've got to trust that he knows what he's doing and admit your lack of omniscience. Joseph says it can be both. And one day that we'll all reach the summit. Hey, can I, can I, can, this theology about my life is good, therefore God is good, really? Baptism of Jesus. Recorded in all four Gospels. God comes down, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So, okay, Jesus has done something good. God says, I'm pleased. What is the next thing that happens in Jesus' life? He's escorted into the wilderness for 40 days and nights. And the devil comes after him. (laughs) I don't think it's any mistake that those two stories are placed side by side. The Bible understands evil and how complex it is but it tries to say to every single one of us you don't know everything everything that happens in your life God is winding you around the journey of your life to get you to the summit in fact listen to this you may have the same goal for your life that God has for you but seldom will the path to get there be the same (laughs) you you might have the same goal seldom Will it be the same? Somebody has said, our face shows grief but not despair. Our head, though bowed, has faith to spare. And even now we could suppose our thorns will somehow yield a rose. Our life with him is full of signs that God writes straight with crooked lines. Dark clouds can hide the rising sun and all seem lost when all is one. You know the best part of this story of Joseph is you cannot muck up your life. What do you mean? Oh, you can make some mistakes, yeah. And you'll suffer the ramifications. You can sin against God, yes, yes, and you will suffer the results. The Bible does say, don't be fooled. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Yeah, yeah. But at any point in time that you say to God, I want to back on the path to reach the summit, God takes all those mistakes you've made and redeems them and actually ends up using them to accomplish ultimately his good in your life. That is amazing. No other story in ancient civilization offers you that. You mess up, you mess up at any point in life when you say, I'm back on the path. God says, okay, I'm going to redeem, I'm going to restore. And I'm going to take all that was meant for evil by you, your friends, or anybody else, and I'm going to use it for my purposes. If you'll just trust me that I'll get you to the top. He stayed off God's throne. He took God's view. And finally, and this is the end, He reflected God's love. He says to his brothers, don't be afraid, brothers. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. How do you do that? This is the end, and I need you to really focus. This is the end. It's not the fake end. It's the real end. (laughs) How can Joseph do that? His brothers, they they betrayed him, man. They sold him out. They they just soon, he'd be dead. I mean, what? And he forgives them. How can he do that? How can he show them the love of God and say, don't be afraid. I'm not only going to forgive you, but I'm going to provide for you so that you live and I'm going to provide for your children. How can you do that? Because Joseph knew something. Joseph knew that whatever they had done to him, he had done worse to somebody else. You you want to take the person who's wounded you and smack them around the woodshed? Who's going to smack you? I mean, whatever they did to you, you've done worse to God, I guarantee it. So unless you're willing for God to smack you around, you better be careful about smacking somebody else around. When you think about it, folks, you've got to let it go. 
It's like Lord of the Rings. You remember there's this powerful ring, and the, the ring of power is what it will take to defeat the Dark Lord. And even though it's in the interest of justice, the problem is if you take the ring of power, you're not strong enough to deal appropriately with its power, so it ends up poisoning you. So you might defeat the Dark Lord, but in defeating him, you lose because you become the Dark Lord. And the only thing to do in Lord of the Rings is to take the ring of power and do what? Throw it into the fire. (laughs) What a great metaphor for forgiveness. Somebody offends you, what do you do? You want to exact revenge. I know what you want. I've seen the Schwarzenegger movies. I'll be back. I know what you want to do. (laughs) You want to go and exact. And there's a part of you that, you know what? You can do that. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. What does that mean? Get off my chair, God says. Get out of my chair. That's my job, not yours. You forgive and go straight and go forward because I'll use it all to redeem you. But you've got to forgive. If you don't forgive and you start exacting a plan of revenge, the poison they brought into your life now becomes your life and you become the poison one and you become the dark Lord and the cancer starts to grow in you and you become the very thing that you detested. I I meet people out here in the parking lot every weekend, and they tell me their life story. And I'm okay with that, but my answer is always the same. Get up, get over it, get going. That's the only thing I can tell you. I mean, I'm sorry that it happened to you. I am, and I can't possibly understand, but I can tell you this. You only got one choice in this. Get up, get over it, get going. That's what God tells you. God tells you that because he loves you. You got to get rid of it, man. Otherwise, it's going to poison you. And nobody's going to like you. It's why I say that God treated your, or created your anatomy the way that he did. Your nose on the front of your face, your eyes on the front of your face, your ears point forward, your feet more, your knees. There's only one part of your anatomy that's on the other side. <laughs> and that just proves that some things are meant to be left behind. <laughs> and that's you, and that's me. You've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. Now, for Joseph... He knew that it takes enormous humility and enormous confidence to love your enemies. Humility in the fact that you know they've not done anything to you that you haven't done to somebody else or to God. Confidence that even so, whatever they did to you, God will use that, redeem it, and use that to shape and form you to get you from here to there, the destination that both you and God want you to arrive at. And so what happens? Let's end this together now. Had all this not happened, Joseph would have never been able to save the Israelites. Everything that happened in his life, God took it. Mistakes he made, mistakes others made, his life going south, God uses it. Now, let's, let's, let's think about how uncanny this is. The Israelites would have been extinct by the famine had God not used Joseph. But Joseph was rejected by his own. He was sold for monetary gain. His robe was covered in blood. His father wept and turned his face away. He does good, and yet he suffers for it. He sees the predicament as the will of God, and through one man an entire people are saved. Does that remind you of anybody else? Jesus is rejected by his own. He is sold for monetary gain by Judas. His robe will be covered in blood. His father weeps and turns his face away. He does good, and yet he suffers for it. He sees it as the will of God, not my will, but yours be done. And through one man an entire people are saved, all who call on the name of the Lord. You cannot go through the Bible in any narrative without seeing underneath the story of redemption. Okay, here's how I want to end. This is the real, real end. (laughs) Kevin Durant. All right. This past week, MVP. Now, I don't even like the Oklahoma team, especially because Dane does like them. (laughs) But I respect Kevin Durant. I know enough about basketball to know this guy has ice in his veins. Man, when the game gets tough, he gets tougher. He's amazing. In my opinion, he is the best basketball player right now. All around, he is the best. Doesn't matter what I think, though. I'm just telling you, from my opinion, he's the best. He's MVP. He received his award this past week, and he gave what I think is one of the best speeches I've ever heard by a young man. He thanked everybody that he could think. I mean, his grandfather, his brothers, his his dog, you know, everybody got gratitude. And the word on the street is, and I don't know, and I don't want to judge Kevin at all, I don't know enough about him. The word on the street is, he's a Christ follower. But you know, the media, you never know. But the word on the street is, he's a strong follower of Christ. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. 
in his speech, he thanked everybody and then he looked at his mom. And he said, Mom, I don't think you know what you did. And he began to weep. You had my brother when you were 18 years old. And then I came along. The odds were heavily stacked against us, a single parent with two boys, by the time you were 21 years old. Everybody told us we were not supposed to be here. We moved from apartment to apartment by ourselves. And mom, one of the best memories I have is when we moved into our first apartment, we all sat in the living room with no furniture, and we hugged each other because we thought we had arrived. Mom, when something good happens, I always like to look back and ask the question, what brought us here? Mom, you woke me up in the middle of the night in the summer times, making me run up that hill, making me do push-ups, screaming at me from the sidelines during my games when I was eight or nine years old. We weren't supposed to be here, Mom. You made us believe. You kept us off the street. You put clothes on our back and food on our table. When you did not eat, you made sure we ate. You went to sleep hungry. You sacrificed us for us. And lowering his glasses, he looked at his mom and said, Mom, you're the real MVP. And there's a standing ovation. Here's what I've learned in my life. The harder life is for you, the more greatness you tend to achieve. I don't know why, but in some respects, pain is a gift. Not in all of them, but in some it is. Show me people who have accomplished a great, and I'll tell you, show you people who have experienced great trial. Kevin Durant is one example of many. But the way you're going to respond to the twists and turns as you head up toward the summit will greatly depend upon you really believing, is there a God story? Is there an upper story and the lower story of my life? If you say no, then everything will be meaningless and you will fight and kick and scream and you'll be a chronic complainer. But if you know there's an upper story and God's hand is always on you, you'll be like Joseph. You'll stay out of God's chair and you'll do the right even when you suffer for it. And you will take God's view and you will trust no matter what happens that God is in control and he's going to get you from A to B, only he's going to do it his way. And because of that, you'll be able to, the first two are prerequisites for the third, you'll be able to give grace and mercy to others because you'll know God has given grace and mercy to you. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you so much for the power of a narrative. I thank you so much for the story of Joseph. I praise you right now for the moms in this room. The moms, if it wasn't for their sacrifice and their love for us, so many of us would never, ever have come to the place that we are right now. That you used moms. They were part of that road that we traveled to shape and mold us, to give us a view of God, a hope and a future for eternity. I thank you for them, but Father, I thank you that you never let us go, that you're always with us. No matter where we go in life, no matter how bad life gets, our hope is in you, and we know that you are able to redeem even the worst of our mistakes, and even the worst of what the world's tried to do to us, beating us up, you're able to take it all, redeem it, restore it, and use it for your good. Give us faith, O oh God. Give us a trust that is without borders. No matter where you lead, we follow in Jesus' name. Amen.